Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. <laughs> Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Um, first, I'd like to ask for prayer that my voice doesn't go. Um, but I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm probably not going to get quite as enthused as I usually do. But hopefully you guys are good with that. <laughs> well, we're continuing our Epiphany series this morning. It's called The Citizens of Heaven. Take a look around. You and I, right? We're taking a look at what it means to reveal or to manifest Jesus to the world, okay? By our thoughts, by our words, by our actions, and as I said last week, even by our inactions, by the things that we have left undone that we should have done in Jesus' name, okay? We're basically looking at how every decision matters. Think about that. How many decisions do we make on a daily basis? A lot, if you really think about it. Every decision matters because our decisions reveal to the world our saltiness. The light within that's Christ's light. Our decisions reveal what we truly think and believe about Jesus. It's hugely important as the church. So last week we began to look at Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. We continue that reading today and into the weeks ahead. This is his most radical and, quite frankly, misunderstood texts, teachings. Okay, Misunderstood because, as we've said, people, people mistakenly tend to think because of Jesus' high ideal that he puts up for us as we go through this sermon. That just because it's so high, oh, I can't live up to that. So it must not apply to me. And we'll talk about that a, bit, a little bit more later. But people tend to do that. And so we have to guard against that. Jesus most definitely is speaking to us. How we treat Jesus' words, all of them, including today's, okay, as we've said, will indicate in the end whether we have chosen to build our lives upon the rock of Jesus' words, the rock of himself, or if we have chosen to build our lives upon sand of our own foolish thinking. And this is going to be crucial as we move forward through the coming weeks through Jesus' ethic his sermon, because this is the pathway of peace. It is the roadway of righteousness. It is the highway of holiness. He is 
the way. He is the true life in his kingdom. Okay? And because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished at the cross and at Calvary and his resurrection and his ascension, we now are, by the Holy Spirit, indwelling his citizens of that very kingdom. You hear me? Amen? <laughs> Woo! More accurately, we, by the Spirit, because okay, we can't do this on our own, by the Spirit, are not only citizens of heaven, citizens of that kingdom, but actually, we are Christ's priests and kings. I want us to think about that for a minute. If we look at the Bible as a whole, we will discover that we're a kingdom of priests. I got my collar on, but we are a kingdom of priests. And the Bible talks about even the New Testament that when, when Christ comes again, we, alongside of him, will judge angels and nations ruling with Christ when he comes again. But until he comes again, Jesus teaches us today that we're supposed to be salt and light. Okay, two brilliant and searching metaphors that he uses, okay, to show the church who we are in him and how to live into Jesus' mission, the missio Dei, the, the mission of God, right? Jesus says you, and he's, that's a plural you, meaning the church, all of us, okay? You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again, he says? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled by men. This is a, a penetrating challenge, isn't it, for us? One that we cannot ignore or keep to ourselves, okay? Because church, if we are not salty, okay? I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. If we're not salty, though, we're not good for anything, right? We're not good for anything. This is a, a serious, serious warning here. But again, in case we think Jesus is not speaking to us, we think we are maybe not worthy to live out this mission or not able to live out this mission. Oh, like, what can I do? Just in case we think we're like that, know that, it, that Jesus at this moment in the text today was talking to mostly Jewish peasants, okay? He, he, wasn't, he was calling them the salt of the earth. He wasn't talking to the religious elite. He was talking to his disciples who were mostly peasants. Regular dudes and dudettes, right? Like you and I. Any one of us could be in that crowd, okay? And he's saying, we are the salt of the earth. We are to be salt. What does that mean? What does that mean to be salt? In the ancient world, salt was used as a preservative. And there's a lot of different reasons I could go into, but I'm going I'm to talk about a few. Okay. Salt was used mostly as a preservative. I mean, there were no refrigerators back then. So what did you have to do? You had to take meat, okay, and you had to rub salt on it to preserve it or, or to soak it in a saline solution, okay? So when Jesus says, you, the church, are the salt of the earth, we can then assume that the earth is rotting away. And we see this every day on the news. What happened this week? Violence, division, chaos, confusion, you name it. And listen, it has always been this way ever since Genesis chapter 3. The fall of man when sin came by our rebellion into the world. The decay began then, okay? And decay set in. The world became cursed and rotten, if you will, constantly tending even more and more towards decay. And yes, the world is also beautiful, and that's, those are the little glimpses of God's glory. But we see every day storms and tragedy and violence and, and chaos. That is sin, the result of our rebellion. Decay, decay. And so Jesus is in effect saying, you, my followers, again, he's talking to Jews at first, are to be the salt that is rubbed in to stop the decay beginning with Israel and then moving by the Spirit at Pentecost into all the world that you and I, 
the church would be the light of the world for the Gentiles. Us. That's how we're sitting here today. You and I must be rubbed in, penetrated into society as a light, as salt, so that Jesus' message and ethic and moral can be preserved. The gospel can keep growing. So salt preserves, okay? But it's not only a preservative. This is my favorite part of the talk here. Salt is also a spice, you know, a zesty condiment, amen? I mean, try some McDonald's fries sometime without salt. Blah! <laughs> try my mom's mashed potatoes without a bunch of butter and salt. Blah! All right? How much better is a burger, a steak, uh, a piece of fish, or I guess a bunch of vegetables for all you weirdos out there? <laughs> With salt. Spice. So it is in the life of a Christian, okay? Because salt in its purest form brings spice and flavor and zest to life. To those around us, right? Our very presence in its purest form because of Christ's light that shines within, okay? Can make the bland and the dull parts of life savory and delightful. You know what I mean? can bring our presence by Christ, can bring light even to the darkest places and circumstances. Because we're not only salty and full of light because we're righteous, right, by Christ, but because we choose to live life to the full. I love Jesus, what he says in John 10, 10, I have come to give you life and, and that to the abundance. That's a salty life. Okay? Life is not going to be easy, though. It's not what Jesus is meaning by abundant life. Doesn't always be easy, but I mean, look at the Beatitudes that we talked about last week. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, <laughs> blessed are the, you know, the meek and the, and the mournful. It's not always easy, but we can be salty no matter what and full of flavor. For those around us. Is this us? When we go to work, when we go to, to school, kids, when we play with the kids in the neighborhood, or when we walk the dogs in our neighborhood, when we're at the grocery store, when we're in the traffic jam, when we're at the ball field, you name it. Is this us? The last thing I'll say about being salty, and this is important, when we live lives for Christ, for his glory, salty lives, if you will, you know what salt creates? Thirst. Anybody ever be eating a pizza? pizza? You know, pizza's real salty, and you wake up at night and you can't even swallow. Well, that's a silly joke, but salt creates thirst. And in this instance, it creates thirst for God. Okay? And, and, and being a light in the darkness is, is like a, a moth leading people to a flame. Right? People draw to that light that shines within us. Jesus made people thirsty for God. Wherever he went, people were who were truly searching for God found the, the, the satisfaction of their thirst in him. You know, think about Nicodemus or, or Mary Magdalene or so many others. Woman at the well. So are we salty enough to make people thirsty for Jesus? This is a serious question. Are we salty enough to make people thirsty for Christ? Are we shining his light in dark places and drawing people to himself? Or are we just going about our own way and absolutely being useless? I hate to sound so, but these are the words of Christ. I didn't make this up. Even a little salt makes itself known. All it takes is one bite to know. Just a pinch of salt 
goes a long way and makes its presence felt. So can we just decide today to just even take a step and say, God, lead me. God, lead me in your path. I want to be salty. I don't want to be good for nothing. I want to make your presence felt in this world. I mean, how beautiful, church, is the life of a salty believer, okay? Again, they bring preservation by God at work. This is not something we can do on our own, okay? Again, but the salty believer brings preservation to a decaying world as a living reproof to sin, okay? A salty believer is an enticement to Jesus Christ. Living as one who brings flavor and spice to life and to those around him. Okay? A, a salty believer is one who makes others thirsty for Jesus. So church, as we begin to close, we, I hope we heard today, we must begin to spread out upon the decaying world around us. Salt can sit for years in a salt shaker, but it will never do any good until it's poured out. You know, the altar in the Old Testament, they would pour salt as an offering. Think about that when we come to the table today. We're pouring out our lives. We'll never do any good until we decide, though, that we're going to pour it out. We cannot hold ourselves up, and we are not salt automatically. We are not salty just because we live in the Bible Belt. We are only salt to the degree that we decide in our hearts that we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there such thing as a desalted church? Yes. Our Lord indicates this when he says, if the salt loses its saltiness. And I don't want to debate here whether Jesus is talking about people losing their salvation here, okay? I want to lament the fact that Christians lose their influence in the world. How does salt lose its saltiness? Well, we water it down. Churches all around the world water down the gospel, water down the hard teachings of Jesus. We choose to live as Christians even in a virtually indistinguishable way from the surrounding culture. That is watered down. That's not good for anything. If people can't see that we are Christians, what good is that? That's not salty. We must, in every aspect of our lives, come to Jesus and surround each other with believers to say, Lord, change me, right? Holy Spirit, work in me. Rub me into the world through your grace and mercy and love and penetrate every fiber of society through my life. You know, as, as a student at school, as a, as a doctor, as a nurse, as a teacher, as a lawyer, as a banker, as a filmmaker, whatever you do. Lord, let me be salt that penetrates our society and points people to Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it well. This is a pretty good warning. He says, Jesus brings us into his work. Okay, again, as priests and kings and queens. And the call of Christ means being salt of the earth or being destroyed. It's our choice. I don't think any of us can look around at professing Christianity at large or even in our own hearts sometimes without admitting the possibility of saltless and insipid, bland Christianity. You know? Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, ignite a fire in us. Because if we are not being salty to the world, the world is making us rot alongside with it. The great tragedy is that so often the world does more harm than we do it good. 
So we need to ask ourselves today, is there any difference, for example, between our approach to materialism than that of the world? Are there any distinctions between our approach to pleasure than that of unbelievers? Do we approach happiness differently? Is there a difference in our application of ethics? Does our compassion know the limitations of the world or is it stronger? The answer to these questions informed by the word of God will reveal whether the salt is penetrating. And so Lord, let it be so with us. Starting here at Harvest Church, because I'm tired, I don't know about you, I'm tired of seeing the scandals that rock the church. It's that all of it, I mean, all of us know these stories. It's a stain on Christianity itself. It hurts the church's influence. It's saltiness in the world. It's witness in the world, you know? Lord, have mercy because we've lost so much in this country in particular, our flavor and our radiance and because we've ceased to be salt and light. Our witness, therefore, has become trampled underfoot. Our task as Christians is dire. It's dire. We have to remember that the salt and light metaphors reveal our fundamental task is to mediate God's presence in the world. Every one of us. It's not for just clergy. We are to rule on behalf of God and under God and serving in his mission. Amen? So I ask you to ask yourself, where do I need to be obedient? Ask the Lord. Where do I need to be obedient? What are you calling me to, Lord? Where are you leading me that I've said no? Because God has a mission. And as long as there is a church, there's a mission. Because God has a mission. So be church salt and light, and not in just what we do, but in every fiber of who we are, okay? In our very core, in our very core. You know, last thought I had was this. How fresh, how refreshing is it to be around someone who is genuine? and authentically in love with the Lord Jesus. Isn't it, isn't it nice? Isn't it refreshing to be around a salty, full of light believer? I believe such Christians can exert an incalculable influence on our society. I believe that God can do that in and through us, church. Okay? The salty Christians, their mere presence, right? It brings the peace of Christ, the purity, the flavor, and the friendship, and the impact of Christ everyone around them. And just so you know, it's never too late. <laughs> I know Jesus says that once salt loses its saltiness, it's no longer good for anything. But listen, but with God, all things are possible, right? Let's not empty the cross of his power. Let's not empty uh, the, the, the truth of the gospel that no matter how far we wander, God always welcomes us home with open arms. He can set us on the right path once again. Pat, did you put out some salt on the altar table this morning? I mean, come on with it. Maybe we need to be resalted this morning. Okay? The cross stands above it all. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That proves his love for us. Maybe you need to be resalted today as you come to the table. I want to tell you a quick story. I met a man one time. He, I won't share his name, but he was moved into a, I guess you'd call it a retirement community. He wasn't really happy about it. He was pretty angry with the world. Had some relationship problems with his family. Didn't want to be there. But you know what? A salty Christian befriended him in that community. He ate with him every day. He would encourage him. He would, you know, just knock on his door, see how he's doing. He was a salty believer, you know, and through his witness and through his love, he deeply impacted the man so much that he gave his life, I guess, back to Christ. 
His life was resalted, if you will. You know, in the, in the remaining years, he went from total despair into saying, you know what? I am going to make an impact even in this community. The people who come in to give me care, the people that I'm eating with in the dining hall, the people that I play on my bridge group, because of that one man who decided he was going to be salty, he salted his life, and then he said, I'm going to be salty, and I'm going to rub up against everybody else. And his life made an impact even in his old age. I don't care what age you are. You can be the youngest of children in here. You can be 110. We all have every single day our choice. Let this be us. Let us open up our hands today and say, Lord, let me rub up against you so that I can go out and rub up against others and bring life in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.